Welcome back, everybody. Today we're doing a deep dive into Canadian solar, and uh, let's take a look at the five-year chart. They, I have been like up and down. They really, they really went up after COVID with the cash injection. People thought, you know, solar and electric, and you know, the Tesla boom and everything just sent this stock to the moon, and now it has come down quite substantially. Um, the all-time chart looks really odd. Basically, it looks very cyclical. So it's it's up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, Really, this has to do with periods where solar is like in high demand and then periods where solar kind of falls off a cliff. And uh, yeah, that, that's really what that, this chart has to do with. And we might be in a cyclical um, or a cyclical like uh, trough right now. And this could possibly be a buying opportunity. Let's take a closer look. So a lot of, a lot of stuff I'm going to be going through. What initially drew me to the stock was this $4 uh, I mean, for price to earnings ratio, which is super, super low. Um, also, it was like one of my subscribers told me to check out this stock. So that's what we're doing today. $1 billion market cap, a pretty large company. They say they're the largest solar producer, like basically, I think in the Americas, but they're, they're a solar manufacturer. They make solar panels. Um, let's, uh, let's check out some financials here. Checking out their financials, their revenue has grown quite a bit, all the way up to seven billion. They only grew by two percent last year, and it looks like on a quarterly basis they are declining in revenue, which is not good to see, especially because they had just completed a uh, a massive uh, new manufacturing facility in Texas. So uh, if they can't sell more modules, then that that's a big red flag. Uh, next, their gross profit or their gross margin is. It's okay. It's all right. At least they do have a profit margin. Um, after all their expenses, they have a decent profit margin. It's not. It's not that good. It's only like three or four percent. Um, yeah. But in the last few quarters, they actually had negative operating income, which is terrible to see. You never want to see a negative operating income. But that might just be because of the uh, um, cyclical nature of this business. Checking out. Also, let's look at their shares. So they have diluted shareholders a little bit, but not too bad. Let's look at the balance sheet here. They actually have a pretty decent balance sheet, only 1.54 billion in net debt. Um, and they have revenues of what, like 7 billion. So like, it, it's not horrible, but it's not great to see. And cash flow. Cash flow, they haven't really done, they haven't bought back any stock. In fact, they dilute shareholders a little bit. and They've been issuing some debt and they don't pay any dividends. So they have not returned any cash to shareholders at all. Um, this could be because they're really focused on growth. And you could tell that because they spend a lot of money on CapEx. You can see their cash from operating activities is positive up here in 2023. It was actually negative in 2021, which is interesting. But uh, look at their, their CapEx. Yeah, they spent uh, 1.53 billion last year in capital expenditures. That's probably because they were building a new facility in Texas, and so that's why their free cash flow has been negative for the past four years. Uh, yeah, that's that's obviously not a great thing to see. But if they didn't spend so much on capex, they'd probably have positive um, cash flows, and the income statement shows positive um, because capex turns into net assets and then assets. Um, also count as income. So that's about it for the numbers, I think. We could take a look at their ROIC. Their ROIC is like 8%, which is okay. And their net margin is, I don't know, like 4%, 3 to 4%. Um, last quarter, it was negative. Let's look at the some of their PowerPoint slides. So here, they always paint a really rosy pictures with... Um, investor slides. They're saying that they have an attractive valuation supported by their balance sheet. And yeah, their balance sheet's not bad. They also have an EV to EBIT of 5.4, which is really super low. And uh, and then, of course, they show charts like this. They decrease leverage compared to their EBITDA, and they have strong cash reserves. So they can weather the storm a little bit with some negative income and uh, negative free cash flow. Let's go to the next slide. This is what they're projecting for the total market in photovoltaic 
or I mean for solar panels basically. And it was a 10x over the past 10 years, and they're expecting like plus 10% every year from now on. Um, I think that's totally realistic, so nothing nothing too bad there. We've got uh, Canadian solar has grown faster than the industry average, so that's that's good. But yeah, this this is of course coming from the investor slide, so they paint a rosy picture. Um, yeah, what did I want to say here? Yeah, they're like expanding. They've got a lot of shipments for solar. Um, actually, what's kind of interesting is this slide here. Uh, this was this was last year in 2022, 2022 going to 2023. They increased the amount of solar modules that they sold and the solar system kits, but they decreased in the battery energy solution. So they haven't sold as much battery energy. And uh, yeah, the bulk of their revenues comes from, of course, solar panels. And that's like, this is a solar panel company and that's pretty much it. Like they like to tout that the battery energy is increasing, but uh this is not what their business is about. So going to Yahoo Finance, we can actually check the short percentage. And the short percentage as percent of float is 13% and short percentage of shares outstanding is 10%. This is a very high short percentage. So, and usually sh um, people that are going short a stock know what they're doing. So that is a red flag with the stock. Uh, the other thing we can look at is the analysis. And we can look at the analyst estimates. There's only seven analysts, so it's it's uh, and and there's a widespread between the high and low estimates. So this company could go either way. And uh, yeah, revenue. They're expecting revenue growth of 18%, probably hoping that the new plant starts ramping up in production and gives them some extra revenue. I actually plugged this these numbers into the DCF model. And the DCF model looks pretty decent because they have such a low um, price to earnings ratio that it really helps it out. So the analysts are expecting 3.43 or EPS for next year and a revenue estimate of 8.6 billion. Buybacks, they don't do any. Net debt of 15 or 1.54 billion and discount rates of 10% because I want the 10% return on my stocks. Exit multiple of 10. Um, just because it's a cyclical business and this business has zero moat, I feel like an exit multiple of 10 is totally fair for this. Um, it's, it's a very low exit multiple, but uh, but yeah, this company, the problem with it, no moat. And that it's so competitive that their margins could get squeezed very easily. Here we have growth. Um, they're projecting 30% growth in their EPS, so that's what I put there. And then just tapering off a little bit. And we're looking at a fair share price. Whoops. My bad. And uh, we're looking at a fair share price between 33 and 57, which uh, implies an upside of like 100% in the stock. So that's like, according to the model, it, it's, it's pretty decent. And with the revenue model with profit margins, it's looking about the same because in the past, they've had an average of like 4% profit margin. So I think that they could get back to that. Um, it depends really on the market and the cyclicality of it because they could actually have negative profit margins next year and the year after, and maybe even the year after that before they start getting back to profitability. And that could ma make a massive, massive difference. Um, and growth of 3%, this is actually probably low because the, the analysts are projecting 18% growth in their revenue. Um, so yeah, this was kind of low probably in terms of revenue growth, but the, the margins are tough. So overall, uh, what's my conclusion on this stock? Well, the conclusion is that this is a highly risky stock and I would not put too much money onto it. Um, the valuation looks attractive. And, but they have never paid out money to the shareholders. It's in a very competitive industry and they could easily go into negative profit margin territory for a few years. And this could really, really hurt them. So yeah, I think that that's, that's the conclusion. I hope you guys all enjoyed. If you did hit that like button, also leave the comment on any other stocks you want me to analyze or what you thought of this one. Um, yeah, also you can try this 
uh, spreadsheet for yourself. Just check the link in the description and I'll see you in the next video.